The title of our message today is Does God Have a Plan for My Life? And if so, how do I find out about it? That will be the message from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. So let's stand together for the scripture reading and the scriptures are printed in your bulletin. Having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the love of God. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Wherein he has made us in all his us. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. According to the eternal purpose, which he made of course in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. Be seated. God's wonderful plan for your life. God has a plan for every life. He had a plan for the redemption of His people from Egyptian bondage. He guided them through the sea and the desert by means of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He had a plan for the return of His people from Babylonian exile where He guided by setting Cyrus on the throne and stirring up his spirit to send the Jews home to rebuild their temple. He had a plan for Jesus. Jesus' whole business on earth was to do his Father's will. God had a plan for the Apostle Paul. In five of his epistles, Paul announces himself as an apostle by the will of God. God has a plan for each one of his children. God's people need to know what his plan is for them. We receive many, many questions from people. Down through the years, I have received many questions about the will of God. When Dr. Charles E. Fuller preached for many years on the old-fashioned revival hour, he said he got more response and more mail when he preached on how to know the will of God than any other message he had ever preached. People want to know how they can know the will of God for their lives. Amen. And God has an answer. And I'll do my best to give you His answer this morning. Here are some of the questions people ask. I was offered a new job in another state. There are a lot of bonuses involved with this new job. Can God help me to make a wise decision? I had a young man come to me one day with that very question. He said, I'm about to move to Atlanta, Georgia, but I love your church. I don't want to leave your church, but at the same time, I have to provide for my family. This would be a promotion, and it would be a raise in salary, and I need to know the will of God. And I assured him that I would pray with him about the will of God. And it was his will that he moved to Atlanta, and he did. <clears throat> Another question. I've had people say, should I marry this girl, or should I marry this boy? God has brought us together, but I would like to know God's mind about our future together. Another question. 
My daughter is a high school senior and she wants to go to college this fall. How can I know which college God wants me to send my daughter to? Another. Yesterday I received word that I was going to be laid off from my job. My wife is out of work also. Does God have a plan for us? <clears throat> I need to know because I feel so hopeless. Another. For several years, I used drugs. But today, thanks to God's help and the support of my church family, I am drug free. But I feel so shameful. Can God still use me? Does He have a plan for my life? Is there hope for my future? Then again, last week, my doorbell rang and I opened the door to a sight that I feared would come. Two army officers stood before me with the news that my son had been killed in battle. My grief is so great, I don't understand God's will at all. My son was so young. What is God doing? Is there a way that He will use this for some purpose in the future? Another. I never realized I could feel so lonely. However, after my husband left me last year, I struggle with deep feelings of loneliness and fear. Does God have a plan for me? Will I ever feel happy and alive again? And one last one. I am 31 years old, and my doctor told me last week that I had cancer. I don't understand. I love God, and I've been living my life for Him. Why is He allowing this to happen? Does He have a purpose in my suffering? These are questions that we need answers to. And there is a way to find the answer to these kind of questions. First, let me talk a little bit about the nature of God's plan. What kind of a plan is it that God has for us? First of all, it's a very wise plan. He who has all knowledge and all wisdom, he who is omniscient, who knows all things, he knows how to devise a wise plan for you. Romans 33, verse 36, Paul, contemplating that, explained all oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been His counselor? Or who hath first given to Him? And it shall be recompensed unto Him again. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things to whom be glory forever. The widow name saw Jesus raise her son from the dead. The hairs of our head are all numbered, Matthew 10, 30. The Lord knows our sorrows, Exodus 3, 7. He records our tears, Psalm 56, 8. He takes note of our downsittings and our uprisings. Psalm 139. A book of remembrance is written to record those who fear His name. Malachi 3.16 You see, God knows every aspect of your life. Amen. He knows every tear you've ever shed. He knows exactly how many hairs are in your head. Or as the case may be, in your beard or your mustache. He knows all about you. And then secondly, His plan for you is a reasonable plan. Creation shows the planning of God. Amen. God planned the creation. He planned the stars, the planetary systems. He keeps it all together. Every snowflake is different from every other snowflake. Right. No two alike have ever been found. 
Every mineral has its purpose in God's meteorological purpose. And every plant has a specific function to perform. He is even bowing down to the little flower that flows, grows in the field. He bows down to watch and tenderly care for the little plant that grows alongside the road. God is a God who cares about everything and everyone. And then thirdly, His plan is a sovereign plan. No one can change it. No one can stop it. His plan will be carried out. Amen. He is unstoppable. He is unmovable. His plan will prevail, whatever it may be. <laughs> Circumstances of the present and the happenings of the future are fitting into His divine plan like pieces of a puzzle. The poet saw and understood that when he wrote the poem called The Weaver. My life is but a weaving between my Lord and me. I cannot choose the colors. He works steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget that he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly shall God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. When did God make this plan? We're told in the Bible that it was before the foundation of the world. Before ever God hung the stars in space. Before He flung the planets out in their orbs. God made His plans. And He works His plans. Out in eternity past, before you were ever born, God already laid out the blueprint for your plan. And He will lead you into that plan. In the fourth place, it is an unchangeable plan. No one can change it. It's determined at the time that it was made, and it is not subject to change. He is the unchangeable God. The entire plan was determined at once. Therefore, it is not subject to change. And in the fifth place, it is a knowable plan. You can know what God's plan yes. is for your life. Amen. Now, I'm not going to tell you that God will unroll a scroll and show you the end from the beginning. He's not going to reveal six months from now or a year from now or two years from now what His plan for your life is. But He will tell you what your plan for Him is today. And then day by day, He will unfold His plan piece by piece until you see the entire plan. Multitudes have found this to be a noble plan. Abraham, to him it meant leaving his kindred and the Ur of Chaldees and going to a country he had never been to before. For Moses, it meant giving up the wealth of Egypt to wander in the desert. For David, it meant leaving the sheepfold to sit on the throne of Israel. And for the Apostle Paul, it meant suffering and hardship and prison and shipwreck a life of suffering was laid out in God's eternal plan for these men. And they followed His plan with joy, willingly, glad to follow Him because they knew that little old hymn that the children sing, My Lord knows the way through the wilderness and all I have to do is follow. And that's true. 
He knows the way. He knows what's out there. And He will lead us if we just follow Him. In the sixth and last place, it is a personal plan. It is a plan designed entirely for you. It wasn't designed for your neighbor or your friend or your preacher. It was designed for you. A personal plan. God wants you to know His plan for you. In Acts 22, verse 14, He told the Apostle Paul, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know His will. Paul's prayer for the Colossian church was this, Colossians 1, 9, For this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. We are introduced to a formula which will enlighten us about the will of God. It goes like this. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. Now I want to look at that just a minute and break it down for you. First of all, in all thy ways. No matter what you're doing or planning to do, Whatever it may be, in everything you undertake to do, take God into your confidence. Explain to God what you want to do and ask Him to guide and lead you in His will in all thy ways. Don't think that you're capable of making your own decisions. God wants you to let Him in on this and He will help you to make your decision. Second thing, and acknowledge Him. That is, let Him know that you're willing to follow Him. Acknowledge Him. Submit your will to His will, and then knowledge will begin to come to you. Thirdly, there is another thing in that verse. The promise. He shall direct thy paths. In other words, when you do those first two things, you commit yourself to Him, then He takes over, and He takes charge, and He takes you by the hand, and He leads you into His perfect will. A will that is perfect for you, that you could never have dreamed or imagined of. As long as you put your hand in His, He will lead you. He will give you guidance Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. In other words, his eyes will become your eyes. You will see things as God sees them. And then in another point, and I will keep you from error. I will keep you in the right path. A path that is good and right. And somebody says, well, why should I do that? Why should I need to take God into my confidence? And why should I need God's wisdom? After all, I'm not stupid. I'm not dumb. I can think for myself. Why do I need God? Let me tell you something, friend. You need God. Amen. You are not able to do it on your own. You're not able to understand or figure it out on your own. You need the wisdom of God and you need God to help you. So I answer your question. Why do I need God? Because He bought you for Himself with a price. 
Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body belongs to God. Your spirit belongs to God. Your soul belongs to God. He bought you on the cross of Calvary. I'm speaking to a Christian now. He bought you on the cross of Calvary. You belong to Him. You have no right to plan your own life. He has a plan for you. Far better than any plan you can devise. Don't be like the mule or the horse. Psalm 39. God says to Israel and to us, Be ye not as the horse or the mule, which hath no understanding, whose mouth must be held in bread and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Now, I have had people come to me with all kinds of foolish and silly things about trying to find out the will of God. I'll share a few of those with you. This is how not to find the will of God. <laughs> These illustrations I'm going to use are the foolishness of people that don't know enough about their Bible to learn how to understand the will of God. Here's one. That is... Following impressions on your mind. Those could be of God, and they might not be of God. And you don't devise your whole plan on some thought, some fleeting impression that came to your mind. That doesn't mean that it was God speaking to you at that time. There was a lady named Mrs. Pearsall Smith. She wrote a book on the fanaticism of people who claim to be Christians. And she gave some illustrations. I share a few of them with you. She tells of a woman each morning who having dedicated the day of the Lord to the Lord as soon as she awoke. Then when she woke up, she would ask God whether she was to get up or not. What a dumb question. And she would not stir till the voice told her to dress. As she put on each article of clothing, she asked the Lord whether she should put on the right shoe and leave the other off. She said very often the Lord would tell her that. Sometimes she was to put on the right shoe and leave off the other. Sometimes she was to put on both shoes and leave off the other. Sometimes she was to put on both stockings and no shoes. And sometimes both shoes and no stockings. And it was the same with all the articles of dress. Now this poor woman thought God was telling her to do those things. God is not foolish. God does not do stupid things like that. Secondly, there was an invalid woman who couldn't get out of bed and a friend came to visit her and as she left, the friend accidentally forgot her purse and left it on the table. So this invalid woman said she had an impression on her mind that the Lord wanted her to take that money for herself. So when the lady came back to get her purse, she said, the Bible tells me that all things are mine. And she hid it under her pillow and lied about it and told the friend that she didn't have it and she was thrown out as a thief. Here again, we meet a lady past middle age who explained there have been times, she said, in order to help my friends to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I have felt distinctly led of the Lord to have them get into bed with me and lie back to back without any nightgown in between. I can tell you right now, the Lord didn't tell her that. Another one. A lady received a brochure advertising the land of Palestine, Israel. She had always wanted to visit Israel. 
but she didn't know if God wanted her to go or not. And so she prayed about it and tossed and turned all night. As she kept wondering if God wanted her to go to Israel, she picked up the little brochure that she had gotten, and as she looked at it, she noticed that the flight was going to be on a 747 jumbo jet. She went back to sleep, and when she woke up in the morning and looked at her digital clock, it said 747. She said, I have my answer. I am to go on the jumbo jet 747. That wasn't God's answer because that had nothing to do with the scripture. Another one. I heard of a young Christian who was struggling with the voice of his career. What should he do with his life? And as he was praying about it, he was visiting Washington, D.C. And as he drove by the embassy for Washington, for uh, the Philippines. She ran out of gas right in front of the embassy of the Philippines and she concluded that that meant God wanted her to go to the Philippines as a missionary. That's a pretty precarious way to find God's will. I wonder what this young man would have done if he'd been stuck in an elevator with some woman named Mary, would that mean he was to marry her? <laughs> I read of a young man that needed to buy a car. He didn't know which one God wanted him to buy. And he agonized over it. Lord, what kind of a car do you want me to buy? He went down to the car lot. And during the night, he had dreamed all night, and everything he dreamed was yellow. He went into the car lot and said, do you have any yellow cars? They said, we have one. And it was yellow inside and out. He didn't test drive it. He didn't listen to the motor. He just bought it and took it home. It was a lemon. <laughs> there was a woman who drove down the street. And she said, now, Lord, if you want me to do option A, let the light be green when I get there. That's not the way you find the will of God. Another fellow said, if it's your will, Lord, I want my phone to ring tonight at 1021. God doesn't lend himself to that kind of foolishness. That's not the way to find the will of God. People like that are like the ones that remind me of Christopher Columbus. You know, he sailed out to find the new world. Somebody said when he started out, he didn't know where he was going. And when he got there, he didn't know where he was. And when he went back home, he didn't know where he had been. And that's about the confusion that these kind of people get into. It's highly found among certain groups, religious groups, Pentecostals, charismatic groups, they're, they're big on that kind of thing. And that's why they get into such confused and, and nefarious mistakes. I'll tell you about the greatest man that I know anything about when it comes to prayer. His name was George Mueller. George Mueller was a Bible-believing Christian. God laid it on his heart to start taking care of orphans in Bristol, England. He had no money, he had no friends, but he thought that since God had put that in his heart, he should do it. And he started with a few, and more came, and more came, and he built a building, and it filled, and he built a second building, and it filled with orphans. He built a third building, and it filled with orphans, and he did it all by prayer. Amen. He never sent out a letter for an offering. He never instructed anybody to help him. He never took up an offering. He never sent out letters needing help. He just prayed and God provided. And he had a plan. In fact, I'll tell you how he prayed. One day, he had over hundreds of orphans. And they came to him and said, Mr. Mueller, it's 11.30. And the children don't have any bread. What shall we do? 
He said, go out and close the door and let me talk to Father. And he got down on his knees and said, Lord, these hundreds of children have no bread. It's 11.30. And they need to eat bread at 12 o'clock. Father, please send the bread. Fifteen minutes later, an excited worker ran into his office and said, Mr. Mueller, we have enough bread for everyone. He said, how did it happen? The worker said, well, a man was driving past with a bread wagon full of bread to take to town to sell. And the axle broke on his wagon and he can't do anything with the bread. So he said, if you can have it, you can want it, if you can use it, you can have it. And they said, there's enough bread to feed all the children. He said, I knew that was going to happen. This is his formula. When people ask him how he prayed, he was known as Praying Mueller. He prayed in the money week by week and day by day for hundreds and hundreds of orphans and took care of them. Here's the six steps he takes to get his prayers answered and to know the will of God. Number one, I seek at the beginning to get my heart into such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to a given matter. Nine-tenths of the trouble with people is just right here. Nine-tenths of the difficulties are overcome when our hearts are ready to do God's will, whatever it may be. When one is truly in this state, it is usually but a little way to the knowledge of what His will is. Secondly, having done this, I do not leave the result to feelings or simple impressions. If I do so, I make myself liable to great delusions. Thirdly, I see the will of the Spirit of God through and in connection with the Word of God. The Spirit of God and the Word of God must be combined. They must agree. If I look to the Spirit alone without the Word, I lay myself open to great delusions. If the Holy Spirit guides us at all, He will do it according to the Scriptures and never contrary to them. Fourthly, Next, I take into account providential circumstances. These often plainly indicate God's will in connection with His Word and Spirit. Fifthly, I ask God in prayer to reveal His will to me correctly. Sixthly, thus, through prayer to God, the study of His Word, and reflection, I come to a deliberate judgment according to the best of my ability and knowledge. And if my mind is thus at peace and continues so after two or three more petitions, I proceed accordingly. In trivial matters and in transactions involving more important issues, I have found this method always effective. If you follow his plan, you'll get your prayers answered and you'll know his will. Amen. Now, quickly, how does God guide us to know his will? He guides us through the scriptures. If you don't have scripture somewhere in the Bible to confirm what it is that you want to do, then you better not do it. God never goes contradictory to the scriptures. Never. That's why women should not preach the gospel. Because God plainly says in His Word that women are not to speak in the church. And so, God guides through His will. When a woman says God's called her to preach, she's lying. Because that, she's going against what God has plainly said she cannot do. First of all, He guides us through the Word of God. Somewhere in the Bible, you will find a scripture that fits exactly the will of God for your life. No matter how many millions of people that God has put this Bible together for, there's something in there for every one of them who will look for it. For example, 
I was called to a church one time in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They sent me a call and asked me if I would come and be their preacher. So I said, well, I'll come and pray, uh, come and uh, preach for you one Sunday. Sunday morning and Sunday night, and you can either call me or forget me, and I'll go back to my own little church where I'm happy, and I'll stay there. So I preached for them Sunday morning and Sunday night. And they asked me to go sit out in the car while they had a business meeting. And while I was sitting out in the car, I said to my wife, they're going to call me. She said, I think so. I said, but I have to be sure. I cannot give up this little church we have because we love it and they love us. And go to another church, I have to know. So I prayed and said, Lord, two things. You know how much I need to live on. You know how much a salary I would have to have to come to this church. Secondly, Lord, if they don't give me a unanimous call, 100%, then I won't take it. If there's one vote against me, I won't take it. And a few moments a man came out and he said, will you come inside? I came in and they said, Brother Green, the church has voted 100% to call you as their pastor. And secondly, to offer you this amount of salary. And they told me the exact amount that I had told the Lord that I would need. See, God answered. First, I prayed. I considered the circumstances. And I found the will of God. And so I took that church. You see, God can answer the most minute things if they're according to his will if they have to do with the ministry or your life if they have to do with the bible he'll always answer but these silly things he doesn't answer what do the scriptures tell us the entrance of thy word giveth light it giveth understanding to the simple psalm 119 Ephesians 5, 17, Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5, 17. Another word for unwise is foolish. It's foolish to neglect the will of God. Then the second way you find the will of God is by the persuasion of the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives within you. And He is your guide. He is your leader. And you listen to Him. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Thirdly, by prayer. If you want to know the will of God, take God into your confidence. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions we desire of Him. Isaiah 41, 21. Produce your cause, saith the Lord, and bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. James declared, if any of you lack wisdom, that is, need to know the will of God, let him ask of God, it shall be given unto him. And then, fourthly, by the counsel of mature believers, if you're not sure of what to do about a certain course, seek out a friend that's mature in the Christian life. Or go to your pastor. Your pastor can always be helpful to you in giving you wise advice. Proverbs 11, 14 says, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Don't depend on your own opinion. Let other Christians advise you and help you. And then fifthly, by waiting on the Lord. That's the hard part of it. Once you pray, once you saw, once you study, then wait. He don't answer always the same day you pray. He may wait a month. He may wait a year. But He will answer. And you will know He answered. Don't 
expect God to rush when you pray. He's not in a hurry. He never is in a hurry at all. And He may answer you that very day. But He may wait. Someone asked F.B. Meyer, a great Christian pastor, how can I determine the will of God? He said, well, that used to trouble me. But he said, one time I was on a voyage and on a ship, just getting ready to enter the harbor in New York City. And I had an appointment that I had to keep. And I went to the captain and I said, Captain, how do you know it's so dark tonight? How do you know how to guide this ship into the port when it's so dark? And the captain said, well, there are three things. If you look over at the shore, you'll see three dots of light. And he said, when those three dots of light are in alignment with one another, then I know my ship is on the right course. It will not strike a rock. It will enter safely into the harbor. As long as I line up my ship with those three dots, I know I'm safe. And he said, what are, what are the three dots? And the old ship captain said, well, those three dots for a Christian are the Word of God, the circumstances, and the conviction of your heart. Mm. When you know in your heart that this is what God wants, and when you study the Word of God and get a confirmation from the Scripture, and when the circumstances seem to indicate, then you lined up three dots and you're safe to move ahead. And if the dots are out of alignment, you better wait. You better wait. A lady one time in one of our churches left the church. And I went to call on her to ask her why she left the church. She said, I left the church to join this religion it was a false religion. It was called the Jehovah Witnesses. And she said, I joined them because they made me feel so good. She let her feelings determine her doctrine. They made me feel so good. The devil can make you feel good if it will work in his plan. Another lady came to the church one day and asked me, she said, Pastor, would it be all right for me to marry this man? He's a nice man, and uh, he's a Mormon, but she said, I'm going to win him to the Lord. I said, don't you do it. The Bible says, be ye not unequally yoked together. Don't marry an unsaved person. Oh, she said, I'm going to win him, and he's such a nice person. I said, don't do it. She went and did it. She married him. Eight months later, she divorced him. And she said to me, Pastor, I should have listened to you. You were right. I was wrong. I couldn't win him. He's a Mormon. He's going to stay in the Mormon faith. He doesn't believe Jesus is the Son of God. He doesn't believe anything that I believe. And my life now has been a disaster. I'm sorry. I should have listened. We need to listen to the Word of God. And then one last thing about deserting the will of God. You have to be honest with God. If you're not honest with God, He'll just not pay any attention to you. I read a story one time about a man. On his way home from work, he liked to stop at Joe's and have a few drinks on his way home. And this particular evening, he was on his way home and he said, I'm going to flip a penny, and if it's heads, I'll go home. If it's tails, I'll go to Joe's. He flipped the penny, and it came up heads. And he said, I will try it once more. And he flipped the penny again, and it came up heads again. He said, one more time. He said, this time if it's heads, I'll go to Joe's. He flipped the coin, and it came up tails. And he grunted in disgust and put the penny in his pocket 
and went to Job's. <laughs> he wasn't honest with God. Never intended to be. A lot of people are dishonest with God. They try to fool God and trick God. You can't do that. He knows every thought that goes through your mind. He knows everything you think, everything you do, everything you plan to do. Be honest with God. And God will be honest with you. And He will lead you. And He will reveal His will to you. You need His guidance. You need Him this morning. And if you have never received Him, Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. To give us a home in heaven. To give us eternal life. To give us a clear mind on the will of God. And if you've never done that, you should do it this morning. Right now, you should bow your head and say to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I'm the sinner that you died on the cross for. And I need a new mind. I need a new heart. I need to know the will of God. Help me, Lord. And help will come. Let's bow together in prayer. Let's stand together as we pray. Brother Johnson, would you dismiss us, please? Dear Father, I thank you so much that uh, you've got everything under control and uh, you've got everything planned out. And uh, what a uh, uh, burden that is lifted off of our shoulders. And so I pray, Lord, that you would please just lead us and guide us and open up our ears and open up our eyes to see the path that you have laid for us. As your Bible said, thy word is a light unto my feet, uh, or a light unto my path. And so I pray, Lord, that you would please dismiss us now, send us home with safety, and uh, bring us back again, those of us that are able to make it again tonight. And uh, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.